Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, the information philosopher, coming to you from my ITV studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So today we're going to look at a great, great philosopher because we're on Wednesday and Wednesdays we turn to great philosophers and scientists and look at it from the perspective of their work. And Descartes is the architect or the creator, the, the inventor of what we call today the mind-body problem. And the mind-body problem is one of the biggest problems that I deal with in my book on great problems in philosophy and physics. And I remind you that this book, while it is a print book and available from Amazon, I'm hoping uh, those of you who don't want to actually own a print book uh, can turn to the informationphilosopher.com and find uh, a link on it which takes you to the uh, books which are available, downloadable as PDF files for free. Uh, let me see if I've got that. This page right here. Go back to that page. I'm in Russian at the moment. Uh, kind of interesting. Let's go back to informationphilosopher.com, return, and doesn't seem to be able to get away from my translations. I was demonstrating my translations yesterday to uh, a visitor, and uh, we saw these results, which are pretty impressive. But the question then becomes, how do you get out of that? And I think I need to type in informationphilosopher.com into the location bar, and then we'll get the real website. And I just want to show you that there is a link here. Uh, there's about my work at Information Philosophy. There's a blog where we put up every day a set of notes on the title and the topic and uh, background. And then there's a link here for books. And books basically brings you to this page where if you click on one of the books, my free will or my great problems or my metaphysics, and even the draft chapters of my book on Albert Einstein and how he came up with so many of the critical concepts uh, that form a part of today's quantum mechanics. Uh, the notion of the light quantum uh, was uh, ignored for 20 years and then it was finally accepted. Uh, but his worries about non-locality and then entanglement in 1935 were completely misunderstood, more or less ignored until uh, almost 50 years later when John Bell famously s s suggested experiments that could be done to confirm whether Einstein was right, which he hoped, or whether Einstein was wrong and quantum mechanics was correct. Uh, so today entanglement is a great subject which is arguably at the basis of things like quantum computing and quantum encryption and other things. It's a very important subject, but when Einstein first came up with these problems and mysterious behaviors and what appear to be, but are mistakenly believed to be, infinite speed, speeds faster than the uh, light, which of course violates Einstein's special relativity, all of those modern mysteries are things I hope to work through with you in this series of lectures. Um, it's a lot to cover and we have a lot of time together. I am going to be lecturing uh, every day, weekdays, uh, for the foreseeable future until I get through all the material that I've been developing first on my website, which is what we see behind me. And uh, just to remind you there, uh, there are many philosophers down the left-hand side here uh, that I've studied and uh, given you uh, resource material. In many cases, these Philosophers um, have, have published a book or written articles and I've read those books and articles and then I've abstracted their key thoughts in their own words, which is a very important uh, distinction between my information philosopher website and the two other websites that are, or two or three that are important uh, sources for you as you try to study philosophy and or science, physics, biology, psychology, 
also subjects I'm covering. And the difference is when you go to one of my pages, you're very likely to find critical opinions and an attempt to let the author speak for herself or himself uh, with their own words. And uh, sometimes I bring in articles and give you a copy of the articles, which I find uh, myself through my wonderful privileges at Harvard faculty and the Widener Library. Uh, but I believe that many of the people who will be watching my webcast in the future, today we're only a few dozen people, but in the future uh, there will be people who, uh, and even today some of you, do not have faculty access, do not have journals access, and can't find most of the books, uh, many of them dating back decades, centuries, uh, which I have here at my disposal. So my goal as your information philosopher is to look at a, a great thinker, and let's go down to the one we're working on today, and get the thoughts of that thinker out of the key sections of their work and put it on my web pages or behind the web page in a um, downloadable PDF maybe, or I actually take uh, old books uh, like Descartes' Meditations and his Principles and so forth, and I open those books and I put them into a scanner, uh, which I then convert using optical character recognition, a wonderful tool, very affordable. Today, the scanners that will work with your uh, computers are only around $100, and the software, there are some free ones. I actually use a $100 software package to get the best um, uh, recognition of all the words, and they work spectacularly. My software will uh, ask me, what's the language that I'm trying to scan for? And it'll give me many languages to choose from. I can get Greek, I can get German. Those are two very, very important uh, philosophical languages. And although you don't read them, I bring it in and I put the wor those words alongside the English translations so as to give you as much I can, as much as I can give you in terms of what's out there uh, in the original works. Because when you go and take a class in philosophy at a university today, I believe it's sort of sad that the discipline of philosophy has been so specialized that what you're usually getting is a teacher who, if you're lucky, will teach a lot of the history of philosophy, but te they tend to want to be able to publish or perish, as we say. They've written their own books and their own points of view, uh, and they tend to be the modern points of view, which is helpful. I, I have them all represented on this list here, uh, but uh, it isn't necessarily the biggest, deepest, broadest picture that I believe we need in order to come to uh, the best possible understanding of, of problems in philosophy, uh, which right now in your classes will be taught as problems. And rarely will you find, in my uh, judgment, uh, a, a philosopher out there who wants to talk about solving these controversial problems. Uh, for one thing, philosophers are not in the solutions, solutions business. They're in teaching problems. Uh, I sometimes say philosophers prefer problems. Uh, scientists, however, seek solutions. And what we now know about modern science in several areas, in quantum physics, for example, and in biological research today, uh, what's actually uh, happening down inside our cells and so forth, which is the magic that lets us be uh, ourselves. Um, and uh, that magic is managed by information. Not just the information I'm going to argue is in my mind, your minds, but the information that's throughout every cell in our body, um, of which maybe 10 trillion or something belong to uh, us, they contain our DNA, and recent discoveries find that we have another thousand times that, uh, quadrillion uh, cells, which are living as um, in sync with us uh, as bacteria. There's a huge number of bacteria that live all over the surface of our body and provide a fantastic protection for us. And then down through our uh, digestive system, mouth, down, stomach, all the way through, uh, especially in the gut, a vast number of uh, bacteria which form what we now call our biome, the human biome. And um, all of them are doing work every day and they are dying to keep us alive. Uh, cells are perishing. Some last only minutes before they've 
collapsed doing the thing they do, and they do the things they do at data rates which are spectacular compared to computer data rates. We sometimes think the computer is the greatest thing we've ever invented, but biology had evolved, evolved uh, the equivalent of information creation, information communication, and uh, algorithmic uh, contents which have evolved algorithmically, uh, they've evolved and to become better than their earlier versions, and that's how species improve or evolve, and we get new ones because of chance and so forth. So uh, let's just click on Descartes, and wow, we get a nice big version of the page. Maybe that's going to fit on the screen. Not quite. Let's come down one more, and that's a bit better. If I can move this one over, this is pretty good. Now I'll take it up a little bit. So I can uh, remind you if you did listen in yesterday, no, you haven't, if you're online, you haven't been able, but local Cambridge uh, folks who are watching my lectures uh, over our cable, our public access cable casting station in Cambridge, CCTV, did get my lecture yesterday, but I had some significant technical problems sending my lectures up to YouTube and up to Facebook. Uh, and what I'm doing now is finding a way to record the lecture locally and then try to upload it, as we say, to my website uh, at uh, YouTube and Facebook. Uh, sometime later today, I may do have, I will have to do the same thing. I've been having trouble connecting to YouTube and Facebook. Um, so uh, we're, we're on a topic uh, which I did try to address yesterday, which is the role of chance. Uh, and um, the question of uh, the, uh, on Monday was the question of the soul, problem of the soul or the self or the spirit or the mind. And when we get to the mind, we get to Rene Descartes uh, because basically uh, Descartes is the origin of the, let's see, mind-body problem. So I can go over here and I can cut back and forth between the Descartes page and this is my blog page. Once again, every day in the morning I prepare a blog with a title and then some text uh, which you can find there and those of you who are avid students uh, may read ahead the kind of material that we're going to discuss today in talking through it. So um, I think uh, that's, that's not a bad place to start. Rather than starting with my website, let's actually start with, um, I'll bounce back and forth between this blog page and my website. So in his 1644 Principles of Philosophy, Descartes identified freedom with actions that are not predetermined, even by the existence of divine foreknowledge. Now, what I want to say here is very, he's got a very powerful insight of the modern problem because in his day, what people thought was there was this uh, omniscient God, many still do believe so, who knows everything we do, much as a Santa Claus is said to tell the, tell the kids that they know, that Santa knows what they're going to do, whether they've been good or bad and so forth. Very simple idea, an ancient idea that I've traced back to the pharaohs in fourth century time frame, third century time frame, uh, sorry, third millennium uh, and uh, BCE. Uh, in the early ideas of the, uh, the state, the pharaoh thought that the uh, laws could not be enforced on everyone uh, by almost any number of secret police of, uh, that he could, of security people, thought control people, that he could manage. And so they came up with the idea that uh, to, to convince everyone to believe in someone who's watching what you're doing at all times. And they, then you internalize the rules and recognize when you've done the wrong thing and uh, you face an eternal uh, damnation for doing that wrong thing. Or if you do the right things according to the rules, uh, you'll reward it with an eternal life. There's an important element in uh, creating a new form of 
getting people to be responsible, morally responsible, they argued, within the parameters of the laws. But Descartes was, uh, as I've been reporting, the origin of the mind-body problem because he famously divided the world into mind, which we can see goes back to the ideal realm, perhaps, of Plato. It's basically in Descartes, it's the realm of thought. And uh, the other uh, division, the other dual part, is the body, but we can identify with the material world. Uh, so I should be distinguished there between immaterial thoughts, which in my mind uh, model are the, uh, is the information, the immaterial information that is encoded in the material brain. So my work today has slightly different words. I encourage you to notice the differences, learn how to use them yourself. So for Descartes, the physical world was a deterministic machine. But our ideas and thoughts, he said, could be free, that is to say undetermined, and could change things in the material world, he argued, through the tiny pineal gland, which he thought uh, to be just one in the center of the brain. Neuroscience now and MRIs of the brain uh, reveal that there are actually, as most things in the brain, two little parts to the pineal gland on either side of the central line in the brain. But here are important sections, about a half a dozen of them, that we want to look at in order to get through to Descartes and how in some ways he's quite modern. Uh, he says, the supreme perfection of man is that he acts freely or voluntarily, and it is this which makes him deserve praise or blame. Now, I could take you back to Epicurus, who had said the very same thing, uh, using the very same words, in Greek, of course, for praise and blame. Whether things are praiseworthy and blameworthy depends entirely on whether we can say you are the source of your actions. You are the agent who is bringing about the actions. Now, Descartes is saying that the animals are just machines, which is a break with those before him, the medieval scholastics and all the way back to the Greeks, who thought that the animals also had a, a, a kind of nature uh, which was somewhat like, um, they called it a sensitive animal mind, that animals had minds. As we look around us, it's astonishing to think that Descartes would argue that animals didn't have minds, they were just automata and machines, which is a very popular new way of thinking about everything, that things were being run according to laws which were mechanical laws. So the animals were thought to be mechanical um, machines. And uh, there was uh, right away a group of philosophers who argued, well, that man too is a machine. Uh, maybe he has, she has, whatever. We have extra capabilities, but mostly we are also machines. Uh, that's the beginning of, of a project that comes down for century, from centuries from Descartes' time to the notion that we are all reducible to the material things that make us up. So um, it's physics that determines how atoms interact and uh, chemistry is just reducible to physics. Everything chemistry does can be explained by being consistent with the laws of physics, which they argued for centuries are deterministic laws of nature. And then biology, too, arguably, is nothing but chemistry. And there's a lot of talk that we are, of course, made up of chemical elements. And if the rules of formation of molecules from atoms and so forth are just rules, uh, the fact that biology is made out of those same molecules suggests, well, maybe life is reducible to chemistry, chemistry is reducible to physics, and we're all reducible to laws which were thought to be deterministic laws. And finally, the mind uh, arguably uh, is different from uh, all of those material objects. Uh, some who tried to make it just the brain uh, represent a very large group of people who say we do have minds of a sort, but they are not immaterial and they're not immortal, uh, but they are and they're not a soul. They've done, people who work on this uh, notion that the mind is just understandable as something going on in the brain tend to reject all this talk about spirit and ghost in the machine claims and soul and self, etc. Now, the extremely broad scope of the will 
is part of its very nature, says Descartes, and it is a supreme perfection in man that he acts voluntarily, that is, freely. This makes him in a special way the author of his actions and deserving of praise for what he does. We do not praise automatons for accurately producing all the movements that they were designed, designed to perform because the production of these movements occurs necessarily. It is the designer who is praised for constructing such carefully made devices, for in constructing them he acted not out of necessity but freely. And by the same principle, when we embrace the truth, our doing so voluntarily is much more to our credit than would be the case if we could not do otherwise. Okay. In that one short paragraph, Descartes has more or less set the rules for the problem we have today. Many, many philosophers who think about agents, agents and whether they are responsible claim that we can never do otherwise. We always can only do one thing which happens to be the thing uh, that has been caused by a causal chain coming from the past. And all the sense of other possibilities open to us are illusions, they argue. And the, the, the conclusion from this is that anything that's going to happen in the future must be the what, whichever thing happens in the future. And they think there's only one such thing in general. And just as they look into the past and see that things that happened in the past are not changeable, they are now fixed, we call it the fixed past. So things in the future, we don't know what they will be, but when they do come, when they do become, they will then be fixed. And that thing that happens is the, the actual thing that happens is the only thing that can happen in the future. The future is already out there. We just don't know about it yet. There are some uh, physicist minded uh, philosophers who are convinced that everything that is going to happen is already completely known in the sense of being part of this fourth dimension of time, which is just like another dimension in space and uh, it's, it's, it's completely already determined. But here's Descartes, and he's already saying we need to know, know that we could have done otherwise. That's a subjunctive sort of past uh, tense. Uh, we could in the future do otherwise, is the thing to say. So Descartes goes on to say, this freedom of the will, uh, and the, that we have this power in many cases or withhold our assent at will uh, is so evident that it must be counted among the first and most common notions that are innate in us. This was obviously earlier, obvious earlier on when in our attempt to doubt everything, and this is of course the famous effort to prove that the one thing he cannot doubt is that we think, um, we went so far as to make the supposition of some supremely powerful author of our being who was attempting to deceive us in every possible way. For in spite of that supposition, the freedom which we experienced within us was nonetheless so great as to enable us to abstain from believing whatever was not quite certain or fully examined. And what we saw to be beyond doubt even during that period of that supposition is as self-evident evident, and as transparently clear as anything can be. So Descartes famously uh, said, the only thing I can't be deceived about is that here I am thinking. And that's never been taken to be a serious proof of anything. It's just some words and it, um, it's not at all clear that he couldn't conclude that I'm being deceived. I, I am, something's happening, but it may be my being deceived by that omniscient, powerful author uh, who isn't Descartes. Uh, I prefer to go back to the notion uh, that he is that author, he is that agent. So then, and here we come into the great dilemma of the Catholic Church for the next 400 years. Part 40 he writes, it is also certain that everything was preordained by God. Uh, marvelous logical uh, conundrum. But now that we have come to know God, we perceive in him a power so immeasurable that we regard it as impious to suppose that we could ever do anything which was not already preordained by him. And we can easily get ourselves into great difficulties if we attempt to reconcile the divine preordination with the freedom of our will. 
or attempt to grasp both things at once. So, uh, and this is the position that's held by theologians who uh, think about this problem of human freedom. The argument is God knows what we're going to do and has already preordained everything we are going to do. Nevertheless, when we choose to do it, it's a free choice and we are responsible for, for that choice. There are some who say that's been put in place in order to just justify punishment of uh, when we do things that are, are not praiseworthy and we like to, the, the church arguably wants to blame people who are doing things that are bad and condemn them to eternal damnation and all that sort of thing. So Descartes can't escape this. Uh, I put up an excerpt from the Latin of this section uh, in which I've yellowed the choice of words in Latin that Descartes chooses um, for our actions. Uh, that line reads, liberas hominum actiones. So these are free actions of a man are indeterminate, indeterminatas. And in the next line, that liberty also has an indifferentiae. Now that's a reference to the old uh, liberty of indifference that says, you come to a point and you can do one or the other, you have no good reason to do either one, but it's up to you and you still have the choice to do the one or the other. That's been criticized on the grounds of sounding like chance and uh, a case where you basically um, throw a coin to go this way or that way because uh, it's indifferent whichever you choose. Now, um, Let's go on past this paragraph, but it's there on my blog and it's on the web page on Descartes in case you're interested in his attempt to go farther to justify this or reconcile this freedom of the will with a divine preordination, okay? And I point out that um, Haldane and Ross had translated this indifferentiae by the liberty of indifference, okay? So, although he writes, part 42, and this is the last paragraph of Descartes' contribution, although we do not want to go wrong, nevertheless we go wrong, and by our own will. Now this is a very powerful insight, which many modern philosophers or philosophically or religiously minded philosophers want to equate free will and free actions. And there's a tradition that goes way back, perhaps to Immanuel Kant, uh, that and there are touches of it in the ancients that says, when you do something wrong, you didn't do that freely. Now that's a little hard to, to rationalize because if we're free, then we're free. And if we do something which is good, we can say we can take responsibility for the good. But the idea that if we do something bad, according to the cultural norms, uh, that that was not a free action is a very difficult thing for me to s swallow. And I uh, have many colleagues who are still arguing that. Uh, they identify free will. Uh, the so-called traditional definition of free will is that it's moral responsibility. This is serious confusion from people who are, pride themselves on being conceptually clear thinkers, working hard to un both understand for themselves and teach to those of you who are students uh, this notion that they're thinking very clearly. To me, this is rather muddy thinking to say that we have a freedom, but if we do something wrong, we're not, that wasn't free. That was out of ignorance and out of uh, other uh, rationalizing uh, situations. So Descartes says, now that we know that all our errors depend on the will, it may be surprising that we should ever go wrong since there's no one who wants to go wrong. But there's a great difference between choosing to go wrong and choosing to give one's assent in matters where, as it happens, error is to be found. There he's looking for, well, we didn't know what was the consequences of our action was going to be. And he continues, although there is in fact no one who expressly wishes to go wrong, there is scarcely anyone who does not often wish to assent to something which, though he does not know it, contains some error. Indeed, precisely because of their eagerness to find the truth, people who do not know the right method of finding it often pass judgment on things of which they lack perception, and this is why they fall into error. And there's the reference sections, the Cottingham edition of the Philosophical Writings, of Descartes. 
Okay, so we have someone who has dealt with the problem and de decided to divide the uh, world into a mind and a body. Let's go back to this page. And he is um, here said to be uh, recognizing uh, the physical world as deterministic, earlier uh, lower forms of life like the animals and all the way down are, are arguably machines and deterministic machines for Descartes. But our ideas and our thoughts could be the indeterminata that we just read about. And uh, let's see if I can bring that up onto this screen. I can probably come back here and I'll have him. No, I don't. So I need to go there. So we found him using the notion of indetermined for uh, our thoughts and so forth. Um, so indeterminata, un indeterminism, indeterminacy, and various terms, Heisenberg introduced what he called the uncertainty principle, which is widely accepted to be better described as indeterminacy because we can't determine what the outcome will be of a quantum me mechanical experiment because it involves possibilities. And those possibilities, if there are multiple possibilities, they have probabilities and they will then occur in uh, accordance with those probabilities. If you do lots of experiments, uh, you'll find the statistics of the experiments confirm the theoretical probabilities, which is why the theory is a good theory. But since it say predicts, say, will the electron be spinning up or spinning down? 50-50 chance. We study lots of experiments. The results show that it's nearly 50-50. And the more you do, the more perfectly close it gets to that 50-50 situation. So it's just like us throwing a die, a die and having it, uh, you know, one of six, and each one of the faces has one sixth of a chance of coming up. So Descartes is fully aware of the importance of chance in the universe uh, as a way to break away from being completely determined by either laws of nature or uh, the one, one idea that you're preordained to do everything. So what I, I thought I wanted to do for the remaining time we have uh, is to go back to the underlying chance and the idea of chance and how important that idea is at four different levels uh, of the of, of or stages or phases between the origin of the universe itself some 14 billion years ago down to today and what we're talking about is going on in a human mind. I will be doing a more detailed look at all of these um, in future courses, but classes, but uh, I thought of, this is a good time to start with the idea that chance is playing a role and see how it plays that role and what sort of uh, thing is going on. Um, I've got some notes here somewhere. Let me go to my overhead camera. Here we go. Um, I basically want to repeat that without chance, there can be no new information. And what does that mean? It's Claude Shannon's modern thinking about the uh, question of uh, the information in a message. If the message can only contain one possibility and there is no uh, chance involved, that there are other possibilities, then only one message comes through and no new information is possible. So we have this strong connection between chance and possibilities leading to information. Um, and we're going to talk about at the origin of the universe when we have in the earliest moments, uh, and I do really mean the first moments, well under the first three minutes, the famous line uh, of Steve Weinberger. And, and then uh, secondly, we'll jump to 400 million years later when the first galaxies form then stars and planets and see the role for uh, chance at that time and then and the creation of these wonderful information structures. And then we'll jump to the planet Earth where we're going to look, talk about the origin and evolution of life and the role that chance plays 
in creating the new information stu structures of living things. And then we'll go to the mind and we'll talk about my experience recorder and reproducer working in the context of the neurons and I'll be telling you that the neurons uh, grow in original, originally totally by chance, randomly uh, connecting to other neurons and so forth with 10,000 dendritic connections for each uh, neuron. And how Donald Hebb said, each experience when we have it uh, causes uh, the neuro some neurons to fire. They are, they are dependent on exactly how your sensory organs, the eyes and the ears and so forth, uh, feed into the, uh, that neocortex, feed into the sensory uh, and uh, cortex, and which connects to this enormous storage system called the neocortex. So let's let's start at the beginning, and literally, this is a case where we're we're going to talk about the very beginning. And uh, sad to say, I can't bring up that overhead camera, but I can, and so I can't give us this view of uh, my notes, which I should have probably thought ahead and made a copy of that onto a slide. Uh, and so let me take a moment and uh, open a new page here. I'm on Rene Descartes. Let me go here and uh, open a new page. Go to Info Philosopher, which you can do. And in this case, I'd like to look on either the page on the creation uh, at the beginning of the universe or the information and how it came about. Let's start with the creation. And, ah, look at that. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, things I've written some time ago turn out to be very interesting and important. So let's, let's start with uh, this. I'll reduce the size a little bit so this can all fit on your screen a bit better. Take it over to the left. Here we go. Um, and can I bring this up next to myself? Yes, if I put the ATEM over here, I can do this. And here's my page on the cosmic creation process, what I call uh, a single process. Uh, and process is a very important notion. It's sort of distinguished from other purely mechanical ideas in the sense that the process has multiple things happening leading to the product when you're done. Um, we spoke a few weeks ago about um, Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy. It turned out the process in his case was reducing everything to events involving particles. Uh, and each event, he imagined, influenced successive events and were influenced by past events coming in. And that was his notion of process philosophy. Uh, but in my case, the process is to see at each stage what's going on with information creation and the role of chance. So let's start uh, here. I'm describing four important cosmic epochs from the origin to the formation of atoms. And then the second stage, the formation of galaxies, stars, and planets. And the third, the creation and evolution of life on Earth. And fourth, the evolution of the human mind. Uh, so let's start with the formation of atoms. I wonder if there's anything written on this page. Oh, there is quite a bit. Epoch one begins with extraordinarily high temperature and density. Let's bring that page to the front this way. Um, and this uh, universe starts an enormous high temperature, but it's rapidly decreasing because, and here's the most important thing we want to say about epoch one, and it continues to be true uh, to this day, and that is that the universe, early universe, when we see it or theoretically describe it, it is expanding. What does that mean? It is uh, best understood that every particle, which is jam-packed against all the others at this extraordinary high density and full of enormous amounts of energy um, at that time, photons, for example, are very high energy photons and the particles are moving very, very fast. Those earliest particles are quarks, which are later to form into the um, neutrons and protons 
which will eventually accept electrons and become atoms at the end of this first epoch, okay? But what expansion means is that every particle is getting farther away from every other particle. Space is, in a way, being created, new space, in between all the particles. So the universe, some uh, used to describe this first stage as a, a big drop of stuff, and it is exploding away from a center. But that's a mistake because modern astrophysics and cosmology says we do not have a center. Everywhere is equally likely to give you a view of in all directions around, things are always the same no matter where you are. It's called the cosmological principle uh, that wherever you are, the universe looks the same. And it's a, a, a sort of relativity principle that uh, uh, there's no absolute center, no absolute edge. Instead, there is stuff everywhere. But the stuff, which is elementary particles about to form nuclear particles and combine with electrons, and then the stuff of energy, which is high energy uh, electromagnetic um, uh, photons, quanta of light, those are all expanding away from one another. And what's important here is that that opens up more possibilities for things to be. Um, in statistical mechanics or thermodynamics, uh, the study in statistical mechanics is to say how particles are distributed among all the possible places in space that they could be. And there's an additional technical uh, uh, point here that uh, they can be in the same space and they, can, and they can also be much higher energy. And we have the notion of um, what we call a phase space, which each cell of ordinary space has other cells off, not in the dimension of other space in ordinary coordinate space, but in momentum or energy space. They can live at higher and higher energies and be distributed there. Of course, it takes lots of energy to fill up all the uh, momentum or energy part of phase space. But the universe is expanding, and as I write here, wrote some time ago, uh, basically, when the temperature falls low enough, the, quar the quarks, which have been packed so tightly, are frozen out. They're, they're said to be bound into the protons and the neutrons. And these are the first assembled information structures. Uh, I think I'm going to just more baldly state that when they're separated quarks and no contact, no interaction, no sticking together going on, that's a different situation uh, and less information than if we have them packed into a neutron or a proton. So during much of this early epoch, the, the entropy, the disorder, is near its maximum. There's maximum sort of disorder and chaos. But the entropy is very low compared to what it will become. And we're basically now uh, looking at the new particles, uh, nuclear particles, as uh, having relative negative entropy compared to the um, uh, increasing entropy of radiation going away uh, and trying to disperse itself into the, into the enlarging space. So, the next part of this first epoch is when the free electron gas starts to bind with protons into the earliest atoms. And this gas is, is very hard to see through. We call it optically thick. In all directions, should you be able to be there, you, of course, would be toast, so you wouldn't any, couldn't last very long there. You would see light in all directions uh, because the uh, free electrons that haven't been bound into atoms scatter light in all directions. Light scattering, just like the blue light of our sky is the result of uh, sun fr light from the sun scattering off all of the particles. But when we get to around 380,000 years, the universe is around a temperature of about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. It's about the temperature of the surface of the sun. And at that time, the electrons combine with the neutrons, the protons and neutrons, I should say. They form hydrogen atoms with a proton and an electron. When the electron gas gets bound up into an atom, it's no longer able to scatter the light easily. 
when an electron is free, it scatters the light. When it's bound into the atom, now it tends to only be able to absorb certain light frequencies, which create the spectral lines of the atom, like hydrogen or any atom. And there's mostly only hydrogen in this early phase, around 380,000 years. At this point, uh, the atom is now more of an information structure than when it was separated away from any particle like, like the proton. And now we've got a combined little information structure, something I want to keep uh, seeing. In general, when they started first to combine, the electron tries to combine with the proton, it's bombarded by those uh, high energy photons and it gets ionized. It goes back to being a separate electron gas and the nuclear proton. Uh, when the temperature falls low enough though, the radiation field isn't energetic enough to break up the new atoms and we get atoms. Very suddenly, very dramatically, arguably, within a very short time, speaking cosmologically, the whole universe becomes transparent to light. That's to say, at this point, if a photon leaves an atom, which just uh, radiated some energy away, uh, which must radiate away in order to carry away positive entropy, uh, to allow the negative entropy of the little structure that's formed, these photons, for the first time, don't get scattered. And they travel in straight lines from the earliest moment at which the universe became transparent. And you can actually, uh, we can see, quote, we can detect those primordial photons. They've cooled down from 5,000 K to well below 3 K. And they are now microwave radiation uh, because the universe went from being bright in all directions and over the millennia, no, we need a much bigger number than that. Over the uh, billions of years between that 380,000 years, well inside the first billion years, it cooled down and cooled down and cooled down and it got quite dark. The temperature fell from 5,000 to 500, which is still pretty hot, then to 50 degrees, which is quite cool. And we can calculate when that time was. And there came a time when um, the, the matter of the um, atoms, many, many of these atoms, which had formed at 380,000 years, were distributed unevenly throughout the universe. There are areas where there's a little more density of atoms than in others. So the pockets of high um, density matter and low. And at around 400 million years, the forces of gravity, which are universal attraction forces of matter on matter, began to pull that matter together. And so we explain the origin of the uh, second epoch that I'm describing it here. Let's go up for a minute. This is the formation of galaxies, stars, and planets. What happens then is uh, it's gravity which pulls the matter together and makes the beautiful looking galaxies and inside them beautiful spherically symmetric stars like our sun and probably cool objects that never got to radiate energy the way uh, stars do, uh, but they are clearly, when you look at them, much more interesting than the gas which was all chaotically spread throughout huge volumes uh, of, the gala of, the, of space, and they became these objects, which to me are what I would call information structures. And I want to uh, connect uh, chance here with the fact that they form in random places in the universe. Um, so there's a lot of chance involved where a particular galaxy turns out to be. It turns out to be the fluctuations, which are random fluctuations um, uh, that uh, are, are going to uh, lead to the formation of these information objects. And I want to point out a second thing, that the formation of a star or planet or the whole galaxy with many objects like the stars and the planets inside they are all being created by the force of gravity. And they stop because of interactions which are other kinds of forces like the, uh, the electromagnetic force and uh, of, of, of material in general. 
they are no, in no way anything like information involved in the creation of the galaxies, stars, and planets. They're all under the control of other natural forces, the fundamental forces, gravitation, electromagnetism, nuclear forces, and so forth. But that is about to change. Uh, and it's going to change when we get to stage three. I'm not sure, I've, here's Epoch 2, and I describe more of it than I probably have time for here. Um, but I do want to say uh, that each one of these stages, the random element in things is most important connected to quantum mechanics and its randomness, which generates multiple possibilities for things. And everyone agrees that when uh, quantum forces are involved, there's a strong element of chance which creates alternative possibilities, and it brings the idea of being able to do otherwise, which we just thought, we just saw in the thinking of Rene Descartes. But every time we create a new information structure, okay, there's also a thermodynamic step. And that step is that when the, uh, a new information structure uh, comes into existence, let's go over here for a moment, when a new say a star let's imagine that a, a randomly distributed chaotic distribution of matter is pulled together by gravity until it forms this beautiful spherical object the star um, at this point we get involved with nuclear forces because uh, particles of matter the hydrogen starts to squeeze itself so hard that the atoms are crushed together and form helium that's the same thing uh, that's going on in a hydrogen bomb and it provides vast sorts of uh, uh, sorts, sources of, of thermonuclear energy, which are able to keep the star from collapsing. They make it very hot, and it can't collapse for billions of years. Without that uh, stability for billions of years, uh, providing a flow of light out to our Earth, we could not exist. Life could not exist. So that's a critical, important step. But what I want to say about the thermodynamics involved here is that when the star forms a beautiful information structure of apparently a low entropy relative to what it was when it was distributed randomly as the, the gas particles, it's not going to form unless it can radiate away positive entropy. Again, this is a difficult concept for you. I know I'm going to spend lots of time with it. I hope at the end of our uh, work we, you'll be comfortable with the notion that entropy is very important because unless the entropy could be radiated away, we could not have this pocket of low entropy, high information. And so that's the second thing that has to happen every time a structure forms. Go back to the beginning, epoch one, and basically when the atom formed, it had to radiate away the uh, entropy or energy that allowed this negative energy binding and negative entropy in the form of information structure uh, to form. Okay, so now that's our second, our second epoch, and let's jump over to the third, the creation and evolution of life on Earth. Here we're talking about nine billion years after the origin of the universe, or about three and a half, four billion years ago, maybe around five billion years ago, our sun formed, a star, began to radiate this energy out in our direction, and the flow of radiation from the sun is a very great source of negative entropy. Uh, again, it's a low pocket, a pocket I call it, of, of negative entropy and a source of information from which life can form. And it's clear th that our understanding of what happens when molecules form, presumably randomly, combining themselves in atoms combining to become molecules and then going beyond that to where molecules of sufficient complexity have a structure which somehow we have no idea but this is the origin of what we're going to know as the macromolecules of life some of these molecules find a way to capture the same sequence of atoms next to them to imagine two strands of molecule which suddenly become two strands, maybe exactly the same, although when we get to the modern double helix, it turns out it's an exact opposite, a kind of a mirror image, or more than that, uh, 
the famous nucleotides of A, G, C, and T uh, combine up with T, C, G, and A uh, across on the other side of this long helical molecule we call DNA. There I'm jumping ahead, but the main thing is to see that when molecules uh, are able to replicate themselves, then in information is being replicated. And we can't do that without the negative entropy source uh, coming from the sun. Now they duplicate, replicate, and here's the magical thing which Jacques Monod pointed out, that if that had just gone on, repeat, 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 wouldn't be very interesting. It wouldn't be us talking. But at some stage, that copying, that replicating, that duplicating was not a complete perfect duplication. It involved an error. It involved a slightly different um, sequence of uh, elemental components. In, in, in the modern cell, those components are are, uh, are the nu nucleotides. Um, and if the uh, mistake that happens at some point uh, produces a molecule which behaves a little differently from its parents, we have the origin of a new species or the model by which uh, a random change, a mutation as Darwin put it, uh, suddenly when it copies itself, it's different from whatever came before. And now we have the chicken and egg problem which came first and so forth, but I won't go into that because we just have a few minutes left. I want to say uh, we are now showing that chance is involved in creating a change in the living thing, even in this proto-living thing, and, and it will work its way up step by step all the way up to human beings. It's always new information, uh, more complicated information, uh, the cells are enormously complicated compared to the molecules uh, and the little molecular engines inside them that drive them. And of course, human beings are extraordinarily complicated. And we come here to our stage four, the evolution of the human mind. There, I want to point out that when this neocortex that we've been discussing grows in, and that's a characteristic of humans, it grows in completely at random. The neurons initially uh, many neurons are always the same in all animals and very similar number and placement and connection. But when we start to grow in this neocortex, it just seems to be uh, some sort of levels of, of structure in it, but the neurons grow and connect to other neurons with their dendrites more or less at random, making uh, 10 billion neurons connect with 10,000, each one of them to 10,000 others and forming this wonderful random mesh or net, which is going to be a neural network, the way we describe it today. And as Donald Hebb said, our senses tend to uh, fire certain of those neurons. And those that fire together get wired together. So inputs from eyes and ears and so forth and smell, and importantly, whatever emotional um, feeling we're having during that experience, uh, my experience recorder model is, follows Hebb's notion that the incoming sensations wire together certain of our neurons. Now Hebb didn't go this far, but intuitively what is it, what's the good of having them all connected together unless they're some way going to give us something back later? And the way I model that is that the ones that have been wired together, when anything comes in, that resembles even a part of that complex of the experience. Even a smell might come in, and that would cause all neurons that had been wired together now to fire again together, uh, even though only a partial number of them are fired by a new experience. That then allows the new experience to uh, be fit into the context of earlier experiences. That's how it is we have meaning in our lives. And um, we'll talk about each one of these many more times in the future, but for today, uh, time is running out on us, so I'd like to just go back. Maybe I can put up the topic of today's talk on our screen. We've been talking about Descartes and the origin of the mind-body problem, and basically what I'd like to do here is turn on my music, uh, put up my email. For those of you who might want to write and get involved in helping me, uh, because I've been trying to do this all alone, and 
it hasn't been easy as I'd like it to as I'd like it to be. Maybe I need a little help. But for now I'll say goodbye. Hope you'll join me again later. So over here I'll stop this one.